Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this installment of the Good Course EDI Leaders podcast. Uh, today, it's super exciting. We've got Dan Guinness, who is founder and managing director of Beyond Equality, a UK charity that helps um, or works with men and boys towards gender equality, inclusive communities and healthier relationships. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure, Chris. Yeah, really glad to be here. Thank you, thank you. Um, so to kick us off, I suppose, um, a bit of context for what's to come for this session. There is obviously a lot we could cover um, today, but after Dan's given an introduction to himself and Beyond Equality, we're going to focus the conversation on the following, which is men and boys are arguably the most important audience for driving progress towards gender equality. How do we better engage, energise and train them? That is the question we're posing ourselves today. Obviously not an easy question as well as part of that. But um, Dan, over to you for an introduction, please, to yourself and to Beyond Equality. Yeah, well, I think the question you've picked is kind of like the core question that we struggle with or, or think about constantly as an organisation because it's really why we're set up. So the story behind the setup is that while I was back at university as a, as a postgraduate student there, um, myself and some other people were actually looking around what's happening in our communities, what's happening in our classes, what's happening in our sports teams, um, in our colleges, because it was a university that had colleges. What are those issues and why is it that the women in our colleges were so concerned, so aware of, so thoughtful about those issues, whereas men, on the other hand, in general, you know, at large, we kind of saw that these weren't our issues that, yeah, okay, there might be a problem, but it's not me that's the problem. Or when actually we did hear messages, they kind of just went over our head. They didn't really hit us and didn't really stick with us. So the challenge has been we've got 50% of the population, roughly, who's not aware of problems, not thinking about them, not trying to solve them. Mm -hmm. And yet they're also the 50% of the problem um, of, of the population that causes many of the issues that we're thinking about here around gender equality, also issues around mental health and well-being, around creating inclusive campuses. So Beyond Equality was set up in that space basically just to have a conversation that would be meaningful, but that would also have men involved. Um, and so we designed it based on, let's look at what can get men past that like barrier, that wall that's there. And you know, I think we'll talk more about the solutions, but basically it's it, it revolves around saying, hey, you know, the, this isn't a wall that you need to put up of defense because we're not treating you like you're the problem. We want you to be part of the society that's, that's better and you can be and you can do all sorts of incredible stuff there and we're interested in how you can get involved. And then secondly, coming in and being like, and we know that you go through struggles and we know that there's, there's stuff that you're insecure about that you're afraid of so let's also yeah. talk about that mm. and give that space so that it's it's not you getting in to fix other problems, it's us working on these issues together. Totally, they're really inspiring, Dan. And for context, for those who aren't necessarily familiar with what your work with different institutions typically looks like, how does Beyond Equality normally get involved with a new client and then actually the, the sessions you run with men and boys? Yeah. So. Uh, we've divided our work up into four departments, um, three of which are really active. Um, th those being our workplaces work, where we go in and work with anyone from like a, a senior leadership team, taking them through a whole course um, so they can understand what inclusive leadership might look like, how that might relate to masculinities, um, through to uh, we do a lot of work in workplaces on like mental health and masculinity. Um, we do a lot of work in schools. Uh, in fact, the majority of our work is there. And we've, we've worked with about 45,000 young people in schools in the UK. And there we take them through this three module program where we get them to think about masculinities and what sort of stereotypes they see around them and how do those impact on their identities? Then how do those impact on the relationships that they're forming? There we start talking about consent, um, peer pressure, and then also how do those feed into structural issues? So there we talk about gender-based violence. And we also do work with teachers because we know we know really to embed things, it's got to be a whole of institution, whole of school approach. And then lastly, and I, where I know we're going to talk about more today, universities. And here, um, 
we see that we see our work as being really in three different areas. Uh, the first of those is with staff. And here we can provide programs to help them understand what men and boys are experiencing or young men, I guess they're not really boys anymore, but men and young men are experiencing at universities. Um, you know, what are those cult cultural influences coming in? How can we understand the sorts of attitudes they might have, the behaviors that might be happening? What is impacting upon uh, men, a whole variety of different men, and how's that impacting on other people? Um, then we've got work with student leaders who really are like such a fulcrum for this because you can, they're the people that can take messages and translate them and ensure that they're there day in, day out. So if you've got someone who's the captain of the sports team or who's like the welfare officer um, at a hall of residence or whatever it might be, they can just like pick up on these little signs and adjust things slightly and it really shifts the culture. Um, and then lastly, we can work with uh, a group of students and our universities work is individual, but it's really also group, group based. Um, so we do a lot of work with sports teams or student societies, um, a little bit with course groups, but there we're able to open up a space where a young, young people can talk about what are their group norms, their social norms, and how does this relate to three main conversations we have? Um, one, which is around uh, well-being, mental well-being, and that sort of group inclusion. Uh, the second one, which is around sex and healthy relationships. And the third one, which is around inclusion more broadly. And I think that's our uni's project. Um, I mean, feel free to download a brochure from our website for more details, I guess. <laughs> I was going to say, it's, it's a nice overview there. And you, you rightly say, obviously, Dan, we as a company focus predominantly on the university space um, in terms of um, any, any kind of training engagement on these topics. And that's where we focus most of the conversation. But I'm actually really keen where there are yeah, anecdotes and examples, particularly looking at some of the school age um, boys you, you work with that actually help kind of um, inform perhaps how better to be a message or, or foster often hard conversations with people who perhaps haven't had conversations of this nature before, right? I'm sure there's plenty we can learn from there. Um, I guess to that end though, going into, um, and thank you for the summary of the three different areas there of um, how you work with different universities, but I guess when a university reaches out to beyond equality or you have a new kind of you know, discovery conversation around what they're trying to solve or achieve, can you talk us through what typical challenges um, or at least what I suppose problems and attitudes is an institution trying to change on campus when they first speak with yourself or one of the team? Yeah, typically the issues that universities will be facing and that we can help them with um, are not really ones of awareness. And I would say it, like there will they'll normally be already in place like a consent workshop or like a training course around inclusion or something like this that has like a really broad uh, a broad reach and, and lays that foundation for understanding. Um, I think that's similar programs to what uh, you run. Um, and then they'll be bringing us in because they can see pockets where there's a culture that's developing amongst particular students, which is proven to be really harmful. So it might be that they're like, hey, we, we know we've got this issue that's happening at parties where yeah, there's a hookup culture that's creating dangerous situations and we know that there's there's been instances of harassment and assault and we really want to deal with that and we want to try to figure out how we can reach the people who may be perpetrating those sorts of behaviours in the future and making sure that they don't, you know, or um, there might be worries around, around well-being and inclusion within a particular, I don't know, college or hall of residence and people want to start having conversation about, well, what can we do cr to create a more inclusive culture here? But I guess it's that our role then is to, to help people find their voice, help people recognize themselves in that conversation. So for us, you know, issues might range from, you know, bullying, uh, sexual harassment, general sexism, and misogyny, homophobia. Um, any of these might be a reason why universities bring us in. Uh, but it's often focused on a particular pocket, you say, or a sort of subculture almost of right. a particular group of people, students who are part of a, a team or a society or a whole residence where 
that's a, a, a challenge or an issue pertinent to that group specifically, as opposed to being a more general awareness piece across the entire student body. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And then, and then perhaps they're bringing in, uh, say, the student leadership training, where they could see that they want to have mm. like a broader framework across a, a student body, but where they want where they want some yeah. individuals to feel very confident, you know, and competent to actually implement some changes. So uh, that's the solutions that we're offering, um, and how we might kind mm. of slot into existing programs that that universities have, um, and that other providers offer. Got it. I suppose one question to delve into now then, in particular, given the, as you sort of rightly framed um, at the start of your answer there, that your kind of um, approach and work with universities is focused on those particular, an issue or two relevant to a particular group of students. How important is, I suppose, affiliation? So you mentioned like sports teams and maybe the captain of a sports team being a, a particularly instrumental person to have influence on the, the culture within that sports team, right? But where you maybe have universities where the the, 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 you know, the the party culture you mentioned, right? Unless uh, a group of students are part of a WhatsApp group that has a ringleader, a captain, so to speak, in, in that setting, how important is it? Or do you face challenges where actually, how do you get people to engage and have that conversation when they're not part of a distinct, specific team, society, et cetera? Is that uh, a challenge you face often? Yeah. Um... I guess in a way it's not really a challenge that uh, we face as much as a challenge we know that universities are facing, like how to reach the people that, um, if that makes sense, like it is when we do, we do try to help them with that challenge. Um, but to reach the group of people who are already disengaged from, from these social settings, um, that's quite challenging. I mean, there's big conversations in society at the moment and, um, I want to be really careful here to say that I'm not conflating everyone into this category, right? But there are conversations about, well, how do we reach those um, men and young men and boys who are now really feeling antagonistic to society as a whole, not really engaging it, probably mainly connecting in online forums and buying into some, um, well, buying into some quite uh, hateful type of ideas. Uh, you know, the most extreme versions of which are incels. Um, but I think the majority of people are, are well away from there and just kind of sitting in this place of feeling hard done by and frustrated and not being recognized uh, by society and not being valued. Um, so to reach those people is quite difficult. Um, and, it, and again, we're working, well, if you can find places where they are engaging, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, even if that's trying to offer something uh, online or if it's offering like via clubs that they're part of, that's really, really, really important. And also coming in with an angle that we're also interested in like figuring out what you're struggling with and helping you. And that, that'll bring me back to like that main question of where things fall apart often is that there's this real polarization that can occur before the conversation even starts. And there's, there's this image created where every football guy is a football lad and he's a horrible person and he's the problem. And that, that type of dynamic is just going to be a really hard one to get any of those people to actually meaningfully engage in a process of reflection or thought um, not to mention that it's unfair to some individuals at very least, probably, hopefully, um, in my experience, definitely. Yeah. So um, what we what we emphasize then is that um, it can be a really useful thing for universities to say, hey, this, this training is, um, we want to make it mandatory and we want to offer it to particular groups. But there's got to be that linking piece where you're having conversations with people from that group and are actually interested in what their experiences are and what they'd like from it. And quite, quite often what can come up is they are like there's some things where they've got deep concerns about the welfare of their teammates. Um, they don't like that they've got this reputation. They feel attacked by that. It's like, okay, we can talk about that. That's important. Um, but it can also be that there's 
things that are coming up that may be more problematic, but again, they need to come up. So it might be that teams like, yeah, quite quite common um, false belief moment is that um, women uh, make a lot of false accusations and that these conversations are used to target men. And again, it's not a very, um, it's not a thing that should get aired widely in society. Um, it's going to be really harmful and damaging, um, but it's something that should come up in a conversation with someone who's qualified and, and has expertise to actually handle that and to listen to it, give space to it, and then ask critical questions so that people can also see that it's, it is false and that it might be coming from a place of defensiveness or fear or shame or, or whatever else is coming up. Um, yeah, I, I warned you, I warned you, I can go off um, sidewards, but yeah, here we are. No, no, no. So, no, that, it's, it's all. It's all interesting. I think it, it highlights so the, the the complexity and the 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 nuances relevant to every situation, right? How you actually have that almost dexterity to both make things feel relevant to the individual, what they care about, and the, and the pain they're facing, but also have the skill, as you rightly say, that you and your team do to have that conversation, give that concern space, and then unpick it in a manner that's that's you know relevant useful but also appropriate right as well so i think it's it all talks to the the, the the crux of why this is such a big challenge i guess one thing you mentioned earlier on um in our in our conversation was um, about how for perhaps some men and boys gender issues don't feel like a big thing or like they're relevant um in part that'll be because of a lack of lived experience of you know the harassment that women go through on a daily basis but could you talk us through i guess a bit about what you and tina have learned over your your work over the last several years when it comes to if let's say another institution wanted to start having conversations with their their male sports teams for example actually any kind of um insights or learnings you've had around how best to introduce the conversation to make the, the recipients of this conversation that they previously have dismissed mm. actually now start viewing it or more likely to view it as a thing that they either should care about or they 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 find relevant or actually suddenly realize this is a big issue, not something that should be dismissed as irrelevant. Any learnings you can share from your work to yeah. that nature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing is to make sure that when you're introducing it, you're, you introduce it as uh, and you speak about it always as being a problem that lots of different people face, um, people of all genders and all backgrounds face, um, not, not everybody, but some people from um, any gender or any background are facing these sorts of issues. Um, and then once there's that recognition, uh, then you can say, but we do know that particular groups face these issues far more than other groups. You know? And there's the dynamic about actually who's perpetrating this violence and again once you're introducing those conversations you know you want to be offering the full picture and then you want to be focusing on well the key here is how we can all be involved in actually changing small things so this is really stopped you know it needs to stop in our campus and we can stop it here in our campus so it starts to shift between from that moment where you can recognize the problem um, understand that the problem might relate to all individuals in some way and then also show that all individuals can be part of a solution. So I think like a big a difficulty is in translating across that moment of learning where people have to grapple with the fact that their experience or their feeling in a space or of an activity is not what everyone else feels. You know, so like <laughs> there's so many other conversations, it's just like, all right, how do you feel at that party that you've just been to? And the guys are basically like, yeah, it was fantastic. It was just like buzzing and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, be like, okay, could you imagine that it was a different experience for somebody else? Like, what would it be like if you, you really came from a group that, um, that was discriminated against? You know, what would it be like if you're walking there as, um, you're walking there as a, uh, someone who was gay and was like, fairly obviously presenting in a way that people would read them as being as being queer would they also be experiencing that space in the same way you know and getting everything through or how is it how would it be to be the student who's not hitting on 30 girls that night but is rather being hit on by 30 different men that night is that a different type of experience is that 
is moving through that space going to feel differently? And there can be some revelations in that for quite a few people of just saying, oh, hold on a second. I'm not the only reference point or I'm not the only person who experiences this. There, there can be a completely different perspective. And it doesn't mean that it wasn't safe for me or it didn't feel buzzing for me or whatever the, the verbs and adjectives are. It just means that someone else had a different experience of that. And that's also really important to recognize. And, you know, if we want to, then can we like change that experience for all of us? Definitely. I think actually, so, so to go one step further, my question here, and, and actually I um, was one of the early beneficiaries of the workshops you put on because back when I was an undergrad at university, you were uh, doing your, your postgrad work at the same university. And I think I was one of the early people to go through one of your workshops when I was part of the rugby team there, actually. Um, but once you get to that point, then as you rightly say, of people appreciating they're not the only reference point um, for the experience at a party, in your example, the next stage then is perhaps um, help people appreciate that their actions and behaviours, despite being for the most part well intended or just kind of like having fun doing you know what they enjoy doing with their mates can actually have some pretty significant consequences for other people and how they feel and how you know, either safe or welcome they feel in that situation that can be a pretty hard thing for people to come to terms with that actually the way perhaps they and their friends in a certain group are acting in certain situations can be causing discomfort harm etc how do you tend to approach those conversations with young men in a manner that doesn't you know induce excessive defensiveness up front for example yeah um I, and i loved i love you use the word uh, intention because i think we often you know what one really important tool that we use is to just say whatever your intentions were your impact is different right like or could be different right yeah and um part of the way that we get to that is say okay well we also have to own our impact as well and it doesn't mean that you're like a horrible person, like if you had good intentions in your in your step, but you you do want to you do want to consider the consequences of your actions. Um, so, partly it's the way we speak about this, um, and we we focus mm. on not so much like a, a moral judgment of you're a good or you're a bad person, but we just look at what the consequences of the actions are. We speak a lot and we speak a lot in the third person about where we're not saying, Chris. Tell me about the moment you messed up the worst in your life and let's judge that and mm. analyze and pick it apart. We, you know, we try to generalize the situations and unpack things that are more re relatable there. Um, we're always trying to engage people from that position of you could be an active um, person in the situation to, to solve the situation, which still opens up that space yeah. for thinking through. So these are all like little tips that you can draw from you know, that we've drawn from literature and the various interventions that sort of help that process psychologically. But maybe the big thing is we actually spend time at the start of the session being very genuinely curious and interested in what the people would say and what their experience is. So I'm not going to jump straight into the conversation about how can you have a um, less of a harmful impact on the people around you, Chris. Like, I'll, you know, we want to be setting up that situation where we talk about how are you, what are you experiencing at the moment? What's your world like? What are the things you're struggling with? Where's your difficulties? And in that, quite often mm -hmm. what we see is that uh, people can recognize this disjuncture between the, each individual, the whole group's desire for what the group is and all of their experiences yeah. of that group culture. So... And a lot of times people will be like, yeah, um, I feel really comfortable, uncomfortable about all these jokes we make. And pretty much everyone in the room will have been uncomfortable about those jokes and mm. all the bullying that happens or will have moments where they can recognize that. But they've all gotten this pattern where they've just gone along with it. And I, when we open up spaces for that recognition to happen, it's, it's actually really liberating for everyone and really empowering for everyone. And they, they then come out of it with a sense of like, oh, we're dealing with stuff that's impacting upon us as well. Then they're yeah. ready to jump into these conversations. So it's like a, a pathway from vulnerability through to empathy. And that's, Got it. that, that seems yeah. to be an effective way of 
but also a very human way of interacting and definitely right and it's one that makes you feel everyone else is going through or has similar you know, thoughts concerns at points and suddenly you're not the only one who's um trying to you know raise your voice when everyone else in your your team or friendship circle disagrees with you right it makes it a much more um much softer thing to then start perhaps talking about um i guess a, a, a related, oh, sorry, go on. it's a it's a thing that you're doing together right you start to make this mm. this commitment often like that, explicitly yeah. the you know the team at the end of the session we're like well what do you want to take out of this and they'll say i want us to be a space where we can share how we're feeling with each other and someone else is like i want it to be a space where you guys help me not to do those things I'm embarrassed of or those things that I now know are harmful. And they're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll do that together. You know, we'll like, if we're in the situation, we've seen that that guy's drunk five pints, you know, we're going to watch out for him a bit and help him through the struggle that he's going through in his life. And that, that then is not just empowering them to pick out things and call stuff out that they see as bad, but it's also empowering them to, to work on this thing together and to become a better group of individuals welcome, by supporting them. Welcome to the input from the team. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, really, really good, Dan. That's, that's awesome. And I think the last question then on, of this line is really on, as you kind of touched on there, the kind of what next question. I think it might relate to the work you do sometimes with student leaders as well, where it's kind of empowering, educating, upskilling them on how to have impact with the, 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 the group that they lead, so to speak. What sort of things do you typically look for? It's twofold. So one is commitments, as you've touched on there, from the group you're perhaps working with as to what they can work to next, and also equipping people with the mindset and the tools to actually be much more likely to go ahead and stick to those commitments and put them into practice, right? As obviously, it's all well and good, as you know, better than me, I'm sure, having sort of great intention in that session, then if nothing changes afterwards, it's a bit of a shame, right? So what sort of things have you kind of learned that, that helps people stick or want to stick to better commitments and then be better at actually sticking to them after the fact as well yeah yeah one of the bigger things absolutely huge things that we realized is um that often the student leaders want to solve all the problems all at the same time (laughs) and and they want to kind of do it all themselves um and certainly thinking back to when i was i was a student um that's often where i would end up be like oh we need to fix this now desperately and we've got to be involved in all these conversations. And so um, one of the big things to actually make these these processes achievable is to build like a network of people around you and to actually trust others to take things forward as far as they can, to pick things up, be realistic with plans, um, to make commitments over slightly longer periods of, of time. Uh, and those are skills. And that's like a, a realization that we have with, uh, with young student leaders. Uh, and then the other things, we talk a lot about um, some skills or some recognition of what what might be privileges that they have as leaders that they can actually help to make a more inclusive team for other people who don't have those privileges. Um, and similarly, what are some feedback channels that they can open up that might not be there? Because in the same in the same way that you know, we only have our experiences of places and that sometimes it's not the best judge of how everyone experiences a party or whatever else. Sometimes student leaders uh, can not be aware of the fact that they don't actually know that there are some other students who don't feel comfortable as a part of their society or feel it's a bit of like a clique or that they're doing things for one group but not for other groups. And that there, there can just be some work that can get done there in, in building up trust and opening up different channels for people to feed back. Um, and that, that's really important work uh, for them to be paying some attention to. And it can be really small stuff, like, you know, just if they're writing a newsletter, uh, you know, just a few comments at the start that at the moment, you know, where they say personally, at the moment I've been struggling with this in my life and I know I've been looking for this and I've had to... Um, you know, take a step back a little bit from my, whatever it might be, my course or my, my training, something like that can then create space for someone who's also going through their own issues to say, oh yeah, I'm also struggling. I'm, I'm not perfect or I'm dealing with lots of stuff outside of this society or this club or this team and my studies. Um, can I share that? Or I'm going to have to defer for six months or whatever it might be that that, 
you know, that little bit of vulnerability can open up space for someone else to come in and share for themselves. 100%, 100%. And it's, it's fascinating to hear this much, um, I guess, insight and um, I guess learnings you, you can share on having difficult conversations with groups of students um, or obviously different age groups of men and boys, um, often either with a student leader or a combination of them with, with the group at, at hand um, as a, a mechanism through which to foster conversation, awareness, and then kind of um, proactive commitment to, to, to change or improvement in some capacity where I guess we as a company have kind of um, a different angle of attack is less so on these kind of distinct you know, single groups of people with a particular cultural challenge, but really on that broader awareness challenge of, as you touched on earlier, of course, you've got those some people who perhaps are in uh, an increasingly extreme frame of mind that um, is quite negative and harmful against a particular group of people they view as, as causing some of their pain, or even broader than that, perhaps just people who are not interested in any of these topics we're describing today, and indeed aren't very accessible because they're not particularly part of a sports team, a mm-hmm. society, a group where by that affiliation, of course, that's kind of a fairly natural place that a skilled group like yourselves could come in and have a session or several sessions with that group. I guess the challenge that we often hear with universities is how do we kind of engage all students on these key message or topics beyond the ones we can reach through you know, workshop sessions, et cetera, et cetera. And, that, and that's then all around really making <clears throat> kind of content well, a mixture of very accessible and very short, to be honest. <laughs> Brevity is really important today as well, but also making it feel at least reasonably relatable and of interest to at least open and consume some basic key information, key messages, key reasons as to understand why, actually, as you say, Dan, my my experience of life may not be the right reference point that others have. And here's one thing I can do today, this week, that makes my actions that bit better for other people around me right it's um it's that kind of go on. no 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 um i think it's so it's so important to see the whole ecosystem here right with the different mm. uh different parts that different providers and different people within the university are playing um and it's, yeah for sure. I, I guess i'd be really interested to hear how that actually how your conversations get through um and can get at this principle of privilege uh, which is a quite, I feel, I mean, we'll get into that that exact point, right, in this conversation, but it's, it's such an important thing to actually yeah. really get across to people. Yeah, definitely. And it's a hard one to be honest, as you, you kind of well articulated that people understanding, appreciating their privilege, or at least that their experience of life differs from lots of other people. And, and that different experience means that you, you have no awareness of perhaps the, the things that um, people from a different ethnic background, socioeconomic backgrounds, gender role, etc. Um, have a have a different uh, life experience. I think where we see a lot of the, the challenge as touched on there is um, at least with our work at universities is on reaching those who are harder to reach. They're not part of any particular affiliation group and they don't engage with any usual online e-learning content on these topics. They have no interest in doing so. How actually do we get those people to perhaps appreciate that, oh, actually, this stuff is of relevance to me, not only for my own pain, my own feeling, but actually because not everyone has that same experience as me. And, and in our world, that, that takes the forward, basically making kind of micro learning style content really, really engaging, accessible, and as relevant to the broadest audience as it can be, which in of itself is, of course, a learning design challenge, definitely. But if you, you know, picture, um, you know, we've got the academic year coming up in September, the new one, um, having some universities, tens of thousands of students join all at once, this melting pot of different backgrounds, contexts, situations, privilege levels, et cetera, et cetera. How do we actually get all to just come in with a mindset of appreciating, actually, you can have lots of fun here, lots of challenges, lots of hardships. So will everyone in some guys based on lots of factors and actually just appreciating that here are some base level things we can all do to make our conversations, our communities, our culture, that good step, more inclusive, more supportive, more welcoming. Um, it's all about getting people to engage with the, the simplest levels of understanding and key messages. Getting all to engage with that is, is obviously um, better than exclusively getting, obviously, some to engage in a much more comprehensive style session as, as what you describe equally what we're doing here as a company isn't stuff that would be ever be a solution to 
the levels of um, you know, challenge or complex issue you describe where a certain sports team has got a certain culture building that's really, really quite harmful and toxic. If a university came to me with that, I'd be like, that sounds really difficult. And that is not something that we would be well suited to say or to solve, right? That's a thing you should chat to my friend Dan about. <laughs> but um, um, that's the kind of approach we're taking really is that, that wider um, base level of understanding and awareness and then key message and training that can make that, that difference when applied to kind of the student body as a, as a whole, pretty much. Um, if that answers your question there, Dan, which kind of deviated from the privilege point in particular, yeah. but hopefully enjoyed <laughs> the awareness point that I think we were getting to. Yeah, for sure. I, um, and I, I've, I like what you're bringing in there about the universities being like um, this moment where people come in, and I think you use the term melting pot, right? But mm. it's one of the challenges and one of the opportunities. Like for many young people, university is the moment where they've sort of stepped out of, of a bubble that they really understand, you know, that like they, a bubble of their family, of their community, of the school they went to, which also their family 100%. went to in their school, you know, communities part of. And now they're dealing with people from yeah. really different places, different countries, right? Different views. And for what I've seen is that sometimes the lessons you learn in your bubble are ones about these, these are the boundaries and barriers and the limits that you can expect and that we share. And then you get to a space like a university and there's no longer a boundary and barrier necessary that everybody shares from their background because they're different and they're different individuals. So it's that so important to have those conversations about how do we, or for people to be thinking about and aware of, oh, we need some new principles to help us understand how to navigate this space. You know, we can't just fall back onto this is how things are. And then and on that, I guess, I mean, consciously, we're pretty much good for time for our <laughs> usual uh, podcast episode length. So there's plenty we could keep discussing. But I'd love to wrap up with, I guess, one piece of advice you would have. I guess uh, let's focus on that topic you mentioned there. So you've got people who've come from their bubbles, their context, that are all now being brought together all at once with people from lots of different backgrounds and walks of life. And it's, for most, a pretty new, exciting, scary situation to be in. Um, what advice would you give you know, a university, let's say, trying to, as far as that first you know, freshers week, onboarding week, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, first engagement with students is concerned goes, what key things can they do in terms of how they foster uh, a more positive, constructive mindset, open conversation, anything of that nature that can help at least mitigate to some extent this, this key challenge of people from different contexts is coming all together at once? Yeah, I, I think that broad education at that moment is really, really important. And I would be focusing not so much on like hammering down rules or hammering down consequences, but just bring in a couple of those really foundational observations. Um, and probably the most fun foundational of all is going to be exactly this point of we are all coming from different places, right? You're coming from a different place from me, from the person next to us in this classroom. We need to be willing to actually be curious about and then to listen to and to seek to understand and to respect how those various people around us actually see the world and experience themselves and want to put up boundaries around that. And I, I think, I think that foundational interest and concern and compassion for your fellow students is going to be part of what's necessary to ensure like safety at parties and social life and better dating life and whatever else wants to happen. But it's also foundational for learning cultures. Like there's often an assumption that um, students can arrive at a uni and just get challenged and instantly learn everything. Uh, but if you haven't done that work to set up that space where people feel like they're going to be safe to express what they think, and if they're harmed by what other people think or they're harmed by those conversations, they're going to be looked after um, and supported. If that's and respected, if that space isn't getting actively created, then your, your chances for uh, a very full learning aren't going to be there, right? And it's going to be difficult for, for some students at, le at least to be really engaging in university culture. So that 
I would be jumping into that as like a foundational block and then trying to build upon that and probably spending time. Yeah, sorry, you go. <laughs> no, so from, from there, everything else kind of not grows and flows naturally, but without that foundational piece in place, the rest becomes much, much more difficult, right? Right. When you come to address anything in particular. Yeah. Cool. Well, look, Dan, look, that's been really insightful um, and lots to unpack. I'm sure we'll, it won't be the last time we have you on, I'm sure, in this podcast series at some point in the future. But um, thanks again for joining us, Dan. And uh, that is it for this episode of the Good Course EDI podcast. Uh, until next time, thank you for watching.